We'd like to welcome everyone to our debate this year. Uh, the, the title is Resolved, The Federalists Designed a Constitution of Plenary Federal Power. Uh, I have the privilege of introducing our moderator today, uh, the Honorable Judge Trevor McFadden from the United States District Court of the District of Columbia. Uh, Judge Trevor McFadden was appointed to his current seat in 2017. He received his uh, bachelor's in 2001 from Wheaton College, magna cum laude, and his JD from the University of Virginia School of Law, and go who's, uh, in 2006, where he graduated Order of the Coif and was an editor of the Virginia Law Review. Uh, after graduation, he clerked for Judge Stephen Colleton on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. Prior to his appointment, Judge McFadden um, served in several roles in the Department of Justice, including serving as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General, uh, managing the fraud and appellate sections. He also became a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Baker McKenzie and served in law enforcement uh, as an officer with the Fairfax County Police Department and as a deputy sheriff for Madison County, Virginia. Uh, Judge McFadden, we are honored to have you here with us as well as our panelists who Judge McFadden is then going to introduce. And with that, I will turn it over. Thanks so much, Barrett. Um, really great to be with you all. I, I, I think I saw a couple shudders when you mentioned being a deputy sheriff in Madison County. I, I think those of you... Uh, uh, double who's or, or law students who've gone back and forth between DC and Charlottesville may have run into a couple of my colleagues. Um, <laughs> it is always good to be back in Charlottesville and, and great to be at um, a Federal Society Student Symposium. Um, I loved the symposia back when I was a law student. In fact, I enjoyed them so much that uh, even when I was a law clerk, I uh, commuted cross country to go to the symposium that was at uh, Northwestern Law School that year. Um, truth be told, I don't remember the, the, the title, but I do know there was a certain 3L from UVA who was there, who is now my wife. So <laughs> all worked out well. And I just want to tell you, I understand that if you were attracted to this symposium by more than discussions of Publius and Brutus and Agrippa, it's okay, I understand that. Um, back when I was in law schools, the, the Rehnquist era, and we talked about federalism, states' rights, um, United States versus Lopez was a uh, recent decision. We threw around principles like the anti-commandeering principle. Um, uh, today, however, um, one of the hottest topics in uh, legal academia is this conversation um, between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists from the founding era. And our panel today really connects those two ideas, um, this, this debate between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists um, with that um, uh, kind of Rehnquistian interest in states' rights and um, federalism. Specifically, uh, did the framers design a national government of limited powers, or were the Anti-Federalists correct that the powers the Constitution granted to the federal government would quickly subsume any real role for the states. We have two um, wonderful panelists to uh, help us think through those um, issues today. Um, um, first, Professor John McKyle from the um, uh, Georgetown Law Center. He's the Carroll Professor, professor of Jurisprudence there. Um, he teaches and writes on a variety of topics, including constitutional law, legal history, human rights, moral psychology, and cognitive science. He attended Amherst College. He obtained a PhD in philosophy from Cornell, and he obtained his JD from Stanford Law School. Before joining Georgetown, he was a lecturer and research affiliate at the MIT Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences, an associate at Simpson Thatcher, and a law clerk to Judge Barquette on the 11th Circuit. Um, he has a number of publications, including The Elements of Moral Cognition, Rawls' Linguistic Analogy, uh, and the Cognitive Science of Moral and Legal Judgment. Professor Michael McConnell um, also has a uh, Stanford connection. He is the uh, Richard and Francis Mallory Professor of Law there. He is also director of the law school's Constitutional Law Center and a senior, fe senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Professor McConnell teaches law, um, constitutional law, constitutional history, First Amendment, and interpretive theory. 
He's published widely in these fields, uh, including a recent book, uh, The President Who Would Not Be King, Executive Power Under the Constitution. If you all haven't bought that, I would encourage you to do so. My uh, law clerks and I are actually reading that uh, together as a book club. Um, really fascinating read. Um, you. you can pay me later. <laughs> <laughs> um, Professor McConnell attended Michigan State University, um, the uh, University of Chicago Law School, um, after law school, he clerked for uh, D.C. Circuit Judge Skelly Wright and Justice William Brennan. Um, he's argued 16 cases at the Supreme Court, uh, perhaps most pertinently for this crowd, um, the Watershed Religious Liberty case, Rosenberger versus Rector and uh, visitors of the University of Virginia. Um, finally, Professor McConnell used to be Judge McConnell. He was on the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, where he was nominated by George W. Bush and confirmed unanimously. I can't even imagine what that would look like today. Um, please join me in welcoming our speakers. With those introductions, um, let me give you just a word about the how the debate will unfold today. Professor McKyle will argue that the anti-federalists were correct that the Constitution grants the national government broad and at times unenumerated powers vis-a-vis -vis state governments, while Professor McConnell argues that the federalists were correct that the Constitution only grants limited enumerated powers to the national government. Each debater will take about 15 minutes to give his opening position um, and lay out his uh, perspective. All then have a period of um, question and answer with the two of them. Um, they'll give uh, closing statements and then there'll be an opportunity for questions from the audience. So start thinking about them. Uh, with that, Professor McKyle, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Judge McFadden, uh, for that kind introduction. I want to begin by thanking the University of Virginia Law School for hosting this event, uh, to the organizers for inviting me, and uh, to say what an honor it is to participate on this panel with uh, Professor Michael McConnell, whose scholarship I greatly admire. If uh, when you heard about this uh, event, you thought to yourself, one of these things is not like the other, that is between myself and Professor McConnell, I wouldn't blame you because that's what I thought um, when I was asked to, uh, to do this event. Um, he is truly one of the great constitutional scholars of our time and it's a real honor for me uh, to appear here on the stage with him. I'd like to begin by drawing some distinctions in order to sharpen our topic. Uh, these are distinctions that I uh, teach my students when I teach constitutional law at Georgetown and uh, for many years I've taught a seminar an advanced seminar on the drafting and ratification of the Constitution. And so these are distinctions that I emphasize in those courses, and I think they're very important. Um, at the outset, I'll simply just note the distinctions without much explanation. I'll then draw on them to state a general thesis that I'd like to defend today. And finally, I'll say a word on behalf of the thesis before turning things over to Michael. So here are the distinctions I have in mind. The first is the distinction between how the framers designed the Constitution and how they and other Federalists defended it once critics began attacking it. The second is the distinction between powers vested or delegated by the Constitution on the one hand and its enumerated powers on the other. These three terms are often used interchangeably, but that's a mistake for the simple reason that powers can be vested or delegated without being enumerated. In our Constitution, enumerated powers are a subset of delegated powers because some delegated powers are implied. Put differently, there's a critical difference between delegated powers and expressly delegated powers, a point that was squarely raised, extensively debated, and decisively resolved when the Tenth Amendment was proposed and ratified. Since this is a key theme in the account of federal power I'll defend today, it's important to clarify it at the outset. The third distinction is the difference between powers vested by the Constitution in the government of the United States and those powers vested in Congress, the President, or other departments or officers of the United States. The text of the Necessary and Proper Clause requires us to draw this distinction which is crucial to understanding how the Constitution was designed and ratified. 
Nevertheless, a vast amount of scholarship and case law conflates these concepts, causing a great deal of confusion. And finally, the fourth distinction is more methodological. Simply put, it's the difference between historical scholarship that honestly and squarely confronts the role of slavery in the formation of the Constitution and historical work that tends to ignore or distort that issue. So with this background and these distinctions in mind, let me now state my thesis. It doesn't fit neatly into one sentence, but I'll try to give a fairly concise statement of it. In a nutshell, the thesis is that the framers designed the Constitution to vest implied as well as enumerated powers in the United States. Those implied powers include, but are not limited to, all the powers to which any nation would be entitled under the law of nations, such as powers over foreign affairs, Indian affairs, immigration, and other incidents of national sovereignty. All the powers that Blackstone and other writers had explained were tacitly possessed by any corporation including the power to own property, to make contracts, to sue and be sued, to operate under a seal, and enact bylaws, along with other corporate powers, such as the power to remove officers for good cause. Third, the power to legislate on all issues that affect the general interests or harmony of the United States, or that lay beyond the competence of the individual states. In other words, the authorities implicated by Resolution 6 of the Virginia Plan, later modified by the so-called Bedford Motion. And finally, the implied power includes the power to fulfill the purposes for which the government of the United States was formed, including, but not limited to, those ends enumerated in the Preamble and General Welfare Clause. That's a lot of implied power. Among other things, it suggests that Congress can legislate directly for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. That may seem shocking to some of you, but after many years of studying this issue, I'm convinced it's historically accurate, at least with respect to the principal framers. While I don't expect to persuade you of that in the limited time we have today, let me at least try to make the thesis more plausible by offering some clarifications and replies to objections. First, it's natural to object that the Constitution I've just described is not the one defended by Madison and Hamilton in their Federalist essays or at their state ratifying conventions. That's correct. But this is where my first distinction comes into play. If one asks how the Constitution was designed by the framers, then that question must be distinguished from what happened during the campaign to ratify the Constitution once critics began attacking it. In this context, it's worth noting that a common mistake is to assume that James Madison had the leading role in framing the Constitution. The primary author of the Constitution was not Madison, but two anti-slavery northerners, James Wilson and Governor Morris who did most of the actual drafting of the Constitution for the committees of detail and style, respectively. Wilson and Morris were two of the strongest nationalists at the Federal Convention. They were also among the biggest champions of implied national powers in the period before the Convention. Unlike Madison, they believed that even under the Articles of Confederation, the United States already had the implied power to create a national bank regulate public finance, govern Western territories, provide for the general interests of the United States, and do all other acts and things that independent states may of right do. For them, the Constitution was less a radical break with the past than an opportunity to place what the national government was already entitled to do on a sounder footing. Another likely objection to my thesis is that on its face, the preamble is obviously not a grant of power. That's also correct, but it misses the point. The preamble is not a grant of power itself. Rather, it is a statement of the purposes for which the Constitution was created. But the necessary and proper clause permits Congress to make necessary and proper laws to carry into execution 
all the powers vested by the Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. And one of the powers vested in the United States is the power to fulfill the purposes for which that government was formed. That is the original preamble-based theory of implied powers as I understand it. It's a simple and sturdy argument, far more intuitive than many things one finds in the Supreme Court's contorted Commerce Clause jurisprudence, which is often used to achieve the same ends. In the 18th century, this theory was not radical, but mainstream, and it reflected some of the highest ideals of the Enlightenment. Its core premise is that legitimate governments are vested with the power to fulfill their purposes, which include protecting the natural rights and providing for the common defense and general welfare of the governed. This would be true of the United States, even if its ends were not clearly stated in the Constitution. The fact that these ends and the necessary and proper clause are clearly expressed simply makes more explicit what would otherwise be true tacitly and as a matter of course. Turning to original public meaning, it's appropriate to want solid evidence that the founders embraced this robust theory of implied powers. Here my reply is that if one looks, one can find this evidence all over founding era sources. The core ideas come in different varieties and are not always formulated as crisply as I have stated them here. Partly due to their implications for slavery, they were often invoked guardedly or with a fair bit of obfuscation. In many contexts, they were ignored or suppressed in order to avoid saying the quiet part out loud. But the evidence that these beliefs were widely held is clear and convincing if one takes the time to look for it. For example, the original Federalist theory of implied powers was a main reason why three framers, Edmund Randolph, George Mason, and Elbridge Gerry, refused to sign the document in Philadelphia. More broadly, the original the Federalist theory of implied powers was the same theory Brutus, federal farmer, an old Whig and other anti-Federalists warned of during ratification, that Benjamin Franklin relied upon when he called upon the first Congress to abolish slavery, that many members of Congress used to defend the first bank of the United States, and that John Marshall invoked in United States against Fisher, McCulloch against Maryland, and other landmark cases. Finally, this theory was also the same basic argument that Madison invoked when he proposed his amendments to the Constitution in 1789. To clarify why he wanted to add the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution, Madison pointed to the implied powers implicated by the Necessary and Proper Clause. In light of that clause, he explained, Congress was vested with extraordinary powers that enabled it to fulfill every purpose for which the government was established. Let me expand a bit on the notion of original public meaning here. As I've said, some of the best evidence for the original understanding of implied powers that I'm describing are speeches in Congress during debates over the First Bank of the United States. These speeches are not well known because most case books pass right by them to focus attention on the stars of the bank debate, Madison, Randolph, Jefferson, and Hamilton. Yet one can learn a lot about the original meaning of the Constitution from these debates, arguably more so than from the opinions of the first cabinet. Randolph, Jefferson, and Hamilton were writing for an audience of one, and the contents of their opinions were not publicly known until 1805, when John Marshall summarized them in his biography of George Washington. By contrast, House members who defended the bank did so in public knowing the remarks would be published and circulated in newspapers throughout the nation. By 1791, watching Congress in action had become a popular social activity in Philadelphia. And the galleries were full of onlookers, including senators and Supreme Court justices. If one wants to know how the Constitution was originally construed, one should focus on these speeches. And when one does, it becomes clear that many of the founders embraced sweeping implied powers rooted mainly in the preamble and necessary and proper clause. If implied powers were so widely embraced, why weren't they discussed during ratification? The answer is they were discussed by anti-federalists who warned that these powers along with the supremacy clause were dangerous and would produce a consolidated government. Some scholars argue that 
these were exaggerations made to cast the Constitution in a negative light. But the fact is that they were probably accurate interpretations of what founders like Wilson and Morris set out to achieve with the Constitution. They wanted a strong government with power to provide for the common defense and general welfare in unforeseeable circumstances, and they drafted the Constitution accordingly. The fact that Federalists were unwilling to put the Constitution in jeopardy by spelling this out during ratification should not surprise us, let alone lead us to draw false inferences about how the government they designed was meant to operate. A more revealing question is how federal powers were conceived after ratification, when it was time to put the new machine into motion. At that point, government by implication quickly became how the first Congress did business, in the words of one historian. On issue after issue, the oath, removal, assumption, the bank, the United States largely ran on implied powers. Strict construction, states' rights, the enumerated powers doctrine, and similar theories were visible and growing competitors. But this was still the age of federalism when the original Constitution held sway. Let me conclude by noting two corollaries of my thesis, which concern the gaps in the written Constitution, uh, uh, the, excuse me, the first of which concerns gaps in the written Constitution and the second, slavery. So famously, the Constitution seems to be missing certain enumerated powers that one might expect the framers to have noticed and supplied. For example, there is no general foreign affairs power, nor are there expressed powers over removal, neutrality, immigration, Indian affairs, federal eminent domain, or recognition of foreign governments, among others. If the federal government is one of only enumerated powers, along with incidental powers to carry into effect the enumerated ones, then omissions like these seem puzzling. What were the framers thinking? The mystery disappears, and the Constitution becomes more rational and coherent once one realizes that all of these powers can be understood as some of the other powers vested in the government of the United States, to which the Necessary and Proper Clause refers. Perhaps the framers knew what they were doing, in other words, when they decided to enumerate some powers but left others implicit. Finally, let me say a word about slavery. The conventional wisdom among historians is that the Constitution was a thoroughly pro-slavery document, which gave slaveholders practically everything they wanted, including protecting slavery from interference by Congress in perpetuity. The term historians use to describe this doctrine is the federal consensus. On this view, Congress was incapable of abolishing slavery before the Civil War by ordinary legislation because the Constitution simply gave no power to the federal government to interfere with domestic slavery. Regulation of slavery, in other words, was a power reserved to the states by the 10th Amendment. In light of the theory of implied powers I've sketched here, it's natural to ask if the federal consensus was correct. Is it true that the United States could not end slavery? Or were anti-federalists like Patrick Henry and George Mason right when they said this was nonsense? That whether by its taxing authority, its war powers, or even just its implied power to provide for the general welfare, Congress could liberate all those who were enslaved. This question, of course, dominated American history for the next 75 years, and it can be re reframed with reference to later abolitionists. For example, who was correct, William Lloyd Garrison or Frederick Douglass? I won't answer that question here, but perhaps we can take it up later on. Let me just close by saying that in my view, there may be few topics as important as this one. In part, this is because slavery is so divisive its legacies are so profound, and so many of our fellow citizens are justly demanding a reckoning with its role in American history and society. They want to know if America's founding documents can truly be admired, and if so, why. My hope is that some of my remarks today might contribute modestly to that endeavor. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor McKyle. Professor McConnell. Uh, I'd like to just begin by a, a comment on, on Professor McKyle being here, because I think many of you in the room probably don't uh, know John. Uh, he's not one of us, I think that's fair to say. Um, uh, and, but what he is, is one of the, I don't know, five or six scholars around the country with the most comprehensive knowledge of the founding. And I've been attending conferences with John, especially the Originalism Conference in San Diego, uh, for, I don't know, five, six, seven years now. And I invariably uh, learn enormous amounts from him, even when I don't necessarily agree with the conclusions that he might reach. Now, I, I open this way for, for two reasons, because I think they're actually important. Uh, the first is that it helps, that this says something about originalism, that originalism is a method uh, for determining truths about the Constitution. It is not an ideology, and it is not merely a tool for lawyers to get to the results that they want. And the fact that John uh, can be as uh, erudite uh, and thoughtful a scholar in the originalist mode as he is and be as far uh, from many of us in the room as he is, is evidence of that. And I think that's a wonderful thing. The second might be more important, which is that we live in a time when people are not talking to each other. There are you know, significant scholars in law schools who ought to be ashamed of themselves because they would not come to this room and they have given up on the idea that one engages uh, uh, with, with uh, those with whom they disagree on a, on a scholarly plane. And I am just so happy to be able to be here on a platform with John McKyle, who exemplifies an older spirit of scholarship. And I, may I just ask people to give him A slight criticism about the uh, the panel. I actually think we need to have three people up here because there really are three positions. Um, there were the consolidationists, perhaps including Wilson and, and, and Governor Morris, uh, uh, with whom John associates himself. And I think John is basically in the consolidationist camp. And there were the confederationists, those who wanted most, almost all serious power to be in the state level and for the national government, not to be national in character really at all. They, uh, they, their ideal was to have some kind of souped up version of the Articles of Confederation. Uh, the Federalists though, rejected both of those extreme alternatives. We need a Confederationist here to, uh, to have the full range of alternatives because I'm not going to defend that position. There are people today who take that as if the, uh, uh, the, the Confederationists had won the very strong states' rights position. We hear it maybe not frequently in law schools, but it certainly is, uh, is something that one uh, uh, hears around the country. It's a real, it's a serious position. But it is no more true than the consolidationist position. <laughs> the, the Federalist, I mean, just to quote Madison, create, they created a constitution that was partly national and partly federal. They established, they, they, it's a middle course. Now, it wasn't just a sort of a, a silly, you know, a compromise, mushy middle thing. There was a, co they created a coherent theory of government which did create a, a, a very powerful national government, but it was not one of, to quote the debate topic today, plenary power. Uh, the, it did not impart to the new national government what John uh, uh, persistently refers to as a general welfare uh, power. It just didn't happen. It was specifically rejected and uh, the fact that the, that the uh, supporters of the Constitution went to the people and defended it on this ground is not something that we should dismiss. Right? John concedes 
that the, the Constitution was defended to the people, to the ratifiers on this ground. But the Constitution gets its authority from the people, not from the people who designed, the, the men who designed it in Philadelphia, but from the people who ratified it in the 13 states. So what they thought it really matters, what they were told uh, really matters. Now, uh, I believe that the Constitution uh, creates, a again, a, a partially federal, partially national uh, a government. And, and the, uh, the way that, um, that Madison describes this is he says, uh, the powers delegated to the federal government are few and defined, and those left to the state governments are numerous and indefinite. Now, John takes a position here, along with the consolidationists, right, that the federal, the powers of the, the delegated to the federal government are unlimited and undefined, and those left to the states are, well, I'm not quite sure, uh, whatever, whatever pittance is left when the federal government re uh, exercises its unlimited uh, plenary uh, authority. Um, to be more specific, again quoting from Madison, that the federal powers will be exercised principally on external objects as a war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce, and taxation. And then he says the powers reserved to the several states <coughs> will extend to all the objects which in the ordinary course of affairs concern the li lives, liberties, and property of the people and the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. That means ordinary administration of justice, criminal law, uh, property and contract law, tort, family law, and the basic infrastructure of uh, ordinary life. Most Americans in the early years of the Republic would never have occasion to encounter an officer of the federal government outside the port cities where international commerce was taking place and the federal courts, uh, uh, which was the, really the only institution of the national government that penetrated uh, uh, to the interior. Now, that is not, I, not how it turned out. Look around us today. That is not the republic that we have. That we have today. Today, the United States more closely resembles the consolidated union that the anti-federalists warned about. Although I don't think we're all there. I think that if you look at what states do today and the importance of states and the political dynamic of the United States, we are still we still have substantial uh, federal non-national uh, elements. But still, we're a lot closer to a consolidated republic than we were at the beginning. Now, why has that happened? I think John's position is that that was baked into the cake from the beginning and intentionally, and then sold to the American people under, under a false flag operation. Is that a fair uh, a summary? I, I, I don't think that's how it happened. I think it mostly happened because of a series of changes between the founding uh, and today. Most important, the people made a deliberate decision to eliminate the key protection for state interests that was in the original Constitution. I'm talking about the 17th Amendment. The original idea was that each branch, including the states, had a check on all the others, and the state's check on the federal government was the Senate, because the state legislatures chose the senators. So you could not do a single thing without the agreement of a majority vote of the, of the representatives of the state legislatures. You, it's, very, it's difficult to think of a more effective way to protect against a consolidated national government and to protect the interests of the states uh, than, to, than to do it that way. But we, the people, in our wisdom, uh, eliminated that check. I think that's... Uh, but, whether I like it or not, I'm actually much more of a constitutionalist than I am a, 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 an anti-federalist or federalist or whatever we want to call people, a, a confederationist in any event. That's what the people decided. That is our constitution today, and is our constitution is without a mechanism or an enforcement device to, to prevent the accretion of power at the national level. Now, all the states have... Uh, to protect against the, uh, the usurpations of the federal government are the courts, and they're the federal courts. And last time I looked, 
federal judges are employees of the federal government. They're part of the apparatus. That is no, nobody would ever create that kind of a system if you were, if you were sensible about wanting to maintain a federal and state balance. Right. Now that wasn't what the founders did. That's what we the people did with the 17th uh, Amendment. But that's not, that's not the only thing. The people also amended the Constitution in other ways that augmented the federal power at the expense of the states. The 16th Amendment, the income tax, is not just about money. It's not just about money coming out of our pocketbooks. What it did was it gave the national government a claim on the entire wealth of the United States. Prior to that, the federal government had to rely upon tariffs, which today are just a tiny proportion of the, uh, uh, of the revenue. Uh, he who has the money has the power, right? And so now it's the federal government has all the money and the states come begging to the uh, federal government for assistance and the federal government gets to attach conditions uh, and, uh, and, and you're basically off to the races for a, a, a powerful national government. Don't blame that on the founders if you don't like it. You know, blame it on the people for adopting the 16th Amendment. Or don't blame it, celebrate it if it's a good idea. My point is not whether these amendments are good or bad, but just that they exist and a constitutionalist has to embrace them. They are part of the Constitution just as much as the original Constitution of 1787 is, and a Constitution with the 16th and 17th Amendments in it is far closer to being a consolidationist Constitution than the one that, uh, that the framers uh, created. How about the 14th Amendment? So the, for, the, the original idea of the framers, not Madison, but some of the, most of the other framers, small majority, but a more majority of them, was that the states were the uh, safest repository of our liberties because state governments are closer to the people uh, and, and less likely, therefore, to become tyrannical and disregard the, uh, the will of the people. The great distant national government, that's scary because they're going to go off to the federal city and... Uh, and, and they're going to lose touch, and they're going to become, they're going to be, there's going to be a deep state. I think that's what the technical term is. John, is that right? The anti federalists talk about the deep state. Uh, they should have, right? Uh, that's the danger. So, so your liberties are protected at the state level. Uh, that's why the Bill of Rights only applied to the national government. That turned out to be wrong. And here's where part of the slavery story, I totally agree with what almost everything uh, John said about the importance of, of the slavery part of uh, interpreting all this. A part of it is that the slaveocracy was not just about the enslaved peoples. It was an entire totalitarian system designed to keep that in place so that freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of movement, freedom of the press, all of these freedoms were, for freedom of petition especially, all of these freedoms were being trampled in the interest of propping up the institution of slavery. So it turns out that the, sla that the southern states, that the states, far from being the safest depositories of our freedoms, were uh, little tyrannical slave regimes, and, that, and, and it took a civil war to end that, and the 14th Amendment is the constitutional embodiment of the end of that war, and what does the 14th Amendment do? It nationalizes individual rights, and, uh, and, and gives Congress the power then to enforce that nationalization of individual rights, another huge step away from the founder's conception of the balance and in the direction of a consolidated uh, a national uh, government. Even the 18th Amendment prohibition, it's not just about booze. It is also about, for the first time, the United States government having a criminal prohibition, a direct exercise of the police power that affected individual people and individual businesses in the heartland, and we needed a national police force in order to enforce it, the first time we ever have one. 
This is the reason why the Fourth Amendment first becomes contested is because it applies only to the national government. The national government wasn't running around breaking into people's houses other than merchants on the coast but in order to enforce tariffs. Suddenly you had, you know, Elliot Ness and folks, you know, running around violating, well, not, not, not necessarily violating the Fourth Amendment, but often doing it, right? It's the first time there is a, a, a penetration into the interior of a national police force. That's also a step in the direction of a consolidated a national government. The Civil War. Civil War not only did what I just said and, and changed the Constitution with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, but it also changed the way people thought about uh, a nationhood, and that's an important matter, too. I am told, although I haven't done the linguistic research to be sure, maybe this is an, uh, maybe this is an urban legend, maybe John knows, but I am told that prior to the Civil War, most of the time the word the United States was treated as a plural noun, the United States are, and then generally after the Civil War, people using the word the United States treated as a singular noun, the United States is. And if that's true, and I almost, it's maybe too good to check, but assuming that that's true, that means that as a matter of language, as a matter of actual the mores and sensibilities of the people, the United States becomes something more like a nation, not a group of states, but a singular entity, and, and that makes a difference as well. Then another, I mean, it's so such an important point, but the integrated national economy. This isn't something that was done to us by courts or legislatures or anything else, but the economy becomes an integrated national economy. This is just a fact of economic life. And the Commerce Clause, the main reason the Commerce Clause looks so different today than it did back then, it is true the Supreme Court has, has, made, has gone a little uh, far with it. I, I don't disagree on some of those decisions I, I would criticize. But the main reason it looks different is because when you apply the same question, which is, is this regulation of commerce among the states in a world in which commerce is mostly intrastate to an economy which is national in character and where major companies operate in all 50 states, maybe even all the way around the world, it, you get a different answer. It's the same constitution, the same principle, but as applied to the modern national integrated economy, it's gonna, the results of that are gonna look uh, mightily uh, different. Uh, and the same point really with respect to globalization uh, and the fact that the, the world is now so, uh, uh, it, it is on our doorstep, create, meets, creates the need for an enormous national army we have border problems. We have the world affairs is a, uh, is a is a big thing. Now I haven't even really quite. I want to say that I respectfully disagree with many of John's specific points about what happened in 1787. I'm going to mention only one because I think it is quite important, and that is that John. Uh, says that Resolution 7 from the uh, uh, Virginia Plan, as amended and made even more nationalistic by an amendment by Gunning Bedford of Delaware, he says that that was adopted. That Many people have said that, and I think it is just not so. Uh, uh, Gunning Bedford, the, the, the Resolution 6 basically provides that the national government will have this general welfare power. It's even strengthened by Gunning Bedford's motion, right? And then as an alternative, the cr leading critic of this, who is, becomes the chair of the Committee of Detail, uh, namely Rutledge from South Carolina, he says, no, let's, instead of Bedford's motion, instead of Re Resolution 6, let's enumerate powers instead. Now, a lot of people say, and I bet this is John's position, although he didn't quite get into it, a lot of people say, well, no, actually, the enumeration of powers is just an elaboration of what was meant by Resolution 6 as amended by Bedford. 
And so there's really no change. These are really just two ways of saying the same thing. Well, when you look at the votes, every single state that voted for Rutledge's motion to, to ratify voted against uh, Gunning Bedford's motion. Every state that votes for his motion votes against Rutledge's motion to enumerate, with one exception, and that is Maryland. For reasons we don't have time to talk about, the Maryland delegation is a complete chaotic mess. <laughs> <laughs> and and they, they live so close to Philadelphia that the delegates are coming back and forth, and the four of them are, don't agree on anything. And they're, uh, so, uh, but the fact that it was, I think it is quite clear from the, from the record that the enumeration of powers was an alternative to, uh, to the general welfare provision. Uh, and then James Wilson did not dominate the Committee of Detail. I'm sorry, John, it just isn't so. Uh, he was on the Committee of Detail, works on it, but Rutledge is the chair, and he's sitting there with Ellsworth, who is a leading uh, an uh, con confederationist, right? Randolph, who becomes more, uh, uh, turns against the consolidationist position uh, during the summer, and then a moderate nationalist, Nathaniel uh, Gorham of, of Massachusetts. And what they produce is exactly what Rutledge wanted, which is an enumeration of powers, which is an alternative to general welfare, and which was specifically inclined to make sure that this would not be one uh, confederated uh, a national uh, government. So I've gone over my time. I apologize for that. But thank you. As a Virginian, I just want to say, uh, Professor McConnell, I absolutely believe everything you said about Maryland. <laughs> um, Professor McConnell, um, I, maybe to take up the, the uh, confederationist uh, perspective, um, a frequent concern raised by the anti-federalists was that federal courts would overshadow the role of state courts. Um, you, you touched on this a little bit. Um, Brutus wrote, in the course of human events, it is to be expected that federal courts will swallow up all the powers of the courts in their respective states. As we discussed before your current role, you, you were a federal judge and know um, as uh, better than anyone uh, how uh, diversity jurisdiction has allowed any, any number of state, what should be state court, uh, cases to come into to federal court um, as long as there's a diversity of citizenship between the parties and $75,000 in controversy. I, I, I now have Uber accidents coming into to my courthouse on a regular basis. Um, do you, um, weren't the anti-federalists right about this? Weren't, why, um, and, and hasn't this really reworked, um, kind of sucked a lot of the power from the state governments that um, you know, we, we were led to believe would, would reside with the states. So interestingly, diversity jurisdiction was not thought by the anti-federalists to be the biggest problem. They often liked diversity jurisdiction. Uh, it was Randolph who actually sponsored the, the, uh, the bill. Note that the Constitution allows, well, two, two main headings of jurisdiction. There's diversity, and then there's federal question jurisdiction. It was federal question jurisdiction that they thought was so dangerous. And uh, in the first Judiciary Act, the, they don't give it. The federal courts do not have general federal question jurisdiction, which is what I think most of us think of the courts doing most of the time. They didn't get that until after the Civil War. They did get diversity jurisdiction, but I don't think that was nearly as sensitive. And, and having been in your shoes, I th actually think that diversity jurisdiction is in service of federalism powers for this reason. It's the only time when a federal judge is bound by the superior authority of state courts. And I think it, that diversity jurisdiction is a, a really a lovely reminder uh, to federal courts that they're not always top dog. And so I think people who want a continued vibrant role for states uh, in our system ought to celebrate 
uh, diversity jurisdiction. Professor McCall, do you wish to respond to that? I think I agree with all of that. What I'd like to do is maybe respond sure. to <laughs> Michael's. Uh, is there anything else you disagree with there? <laughs> Michael's last point um, uh, that he made about the Committee of Detail, because I think it's an important one. Uh, first, let me say, I think I agreed with almost everything uh, he said up to that point and, and would endorse what he said, including the idea that maybe three positions rather than two is a better lens um, from which to, to look at all of these issues. But as to the Committee of Detail, so uh, this is a very important moment in the convention. I think Michael and I agree on that. He has looked, I think, probably more closely than anyone ever has at how the Committee of Detail allocated uh, royal prerogative powers uh, when drafting uh, their draft constitution and thereby shaped the separation of powers between Congress and the president. And it's a vitally important moment in the formation of the constitution. The point that I've looked more closely at uh, than that topic, not necessarily than Michael, I'm not trying to make that contrast, but the, the, the issue that I've focused intently on is the necessary and proper clause. Because when we talk about the enumeration of powers, we have to be clear what actually happened. First of all, I don't believe that the right distinction is whether to enumerate powers or not, rather, uh, not enumerate powers. Really what they were interested in was the question, are we going to exhaustively enumerate powers or not? And Wilson's position throughout the convention was, it's impossible to exhaustively enumerate powers. That's a foolish jurisprudence. It doesn't make any sense. It's what we just dealt with, with the Articles of Confederation, and this idea that we're gonna cap the powers with something like a reserved powers clause, Article Two, is not a good way to design the Constitution. When it came to the necessary and proper clause, Wilson did dominate Rutledge on how that clause would be formed. He might not have dominated the whole committee, I don't, know, I don't think anyone dominated the committee, but Wilson had the pen, Wilson, uh, Rutledge drafted the first version of the Necessary and Proper Clause, and it was limited to what I've called the foregoing powers provision, the first part of the full Necessary and Proper Clause, which gives Congress the authority to carry into execution the foregoing enumerated powers. It was Wilson who added the second and third parts of the clause, which are the parts that I think the founders were most often referring to when they called the clause the sweeping clause, because the three critical words there are and all other, and all other powers. A sweeping clause has as its central function rebutting the potential implication that an enumeration of powers is exhaustive. Just like the Ninth Amendment rebuts that inference in the case of enumerated rights and says no, there are actually other rights retained by the people, the sweeping clause says there are other powers vested in the government than the ones that are enumerated. Now it's an important fact that there are two parts to the last part of the Necessary and Proper Clause. One vests powers in the government of the United States and one in the Department of, uh, Departments and Officers of the United States, or it refers to those powers. And there simply are no powers in the Constitution of the United States that are expressly vested in the government of the United States. And that's the basis for the inference that the powers to which that part of the clause is referring are implied or unenumerated. In the Committee of Detail, Rutledge has a scrawl on Randolph's draft constitution, and it says the following, insert Roman numeral two article. In other words, my reading of that is that Rutledge was calling upon the committee to add Article Two of the Articles of Confederation, which would have limited the United States to expressly delegated powers. This is a consistent South Carolina position in 1787 and 1788. Charles Pinckney comes into the convention calling for an Article Two to be added to the Constitution. Throughout the convention, people like Butler and Rutledge uh, and the Pinckneys are saying, we're worried about this Resolution Six. We want powers uh, enumerated. Rutledge and the committee calls for adding Article Two. Wilson didn't do that. And we don't know exactly what happened, but I think he had at least two members of the committee with him, probably the northern two members at that point. Uh, but in any event, the clause that comes out of the committee is this complicated necessary and proper clause that has a reference to unenumerated powers vested in the government of the United States as such, apart from those given to departments and officers and enumerated uh, and given to Congress. For the rest of the convention, this gives Southerners fits. 
And the reason is because they saw a threat to slavery. It's very clear. How do they react? Pierce Butler draws an alternative, uh, drafts an alternative necessary and proper clause that would have not referred to unnamed powers vested in the government, but would have simply talked about all other powers vested in the legislature. That's the critical difference that one of my distinctions was pointing to. Makes a big difference if we talk about other powers given to Congress or other powers given to the government, because it's only the latter that bring in those sweeping national implied powers that I've been referring to. This goes on and on, and it goes all the way into the ratifying convention. So when South Carolina ratifies the Constitution, they do so with a, an amendment. It's not really an amendment or a proposed amendment. It's a construction. It's the declaration of an understanding of how they're ratifying the Constitution. And they include the expressly given language. They basically say, we're ratifying the Constitution, and we're doing so on the understanding that the government has only expressly delegated powers. That's a paraphrase, but that's basically what they did. And something similar happened in Virginia. Virginia didn't use the telltale word expressly, but what they did is they ratified the Constitution with an elaborate form of ratification that was phrased in such a way as to negate the implication that Wilson had put into the sweeping clause. I could go on on that point. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot to say there, but this all comes to a head when the Tenth Amendment is proposed. And the insertion of the word expressly uh, in front of delegate, delegated is voted down. It's very much of a sectional split in the country. The most Federalist states, uh, which had ratified the Constitution without proposing amendment, amendments, decisively uh, oppose that. And the other states, which are more anti-Federalist, uh, are in favor of it. But it's a 32 to 17 vote in the Congress, in the House, about whether to, uh, to add that limitation expressly delegated. And that's what the enumeration power debate is all about in my view. So it's not really what Michael, uh, I think the way Michael framed it is whether power should be enumerated. It's whether the enumeration of powers was going to be exhaustive. Stop there. I want to uh, give Professor McConnell uh, the last word on this point. Um, but I, uh, as you do, I want to remind the audience what Alexander Hamilton said about this. Back in Federalist 33, he kind of poo-poos the idea that this sweeping clause is anything to be worried about. He wrote, if there is anything exceptionable, it must be sought for in the specific powers upon which this uh, general declaration is predict uh, predicated. The necessary and proper clause itself, though, it may be chargeable with tautology or redundancy, is at least perfectly harmless. Um, was he right? And, well, I'd uh, like to point you point out I'm wearing my Hamilton tie. <laughs> wait, 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 um, uh, throwing, uh, it looks like he's making a rain. Belt. This is in honor of his not getting thrown off the $10 belt. Uh, so, uh, I agree with exactly half of what uh, has said. He's quite right about the word expressly, and the implications of that I think are just as important as he says. The Articles of Confederation, uh, stated that the power, only the, it was only the powers that were expressly uh, delegated. Uh, there, uh, at the, during when the Bill of Rights is being debated, this is the thing that the anti-federalists, well, we shouldn't call them that anymore, but the, they're the same people, uh, Thomas Tudor Tucker of South Carolina particularly, that's what they want more than any other change to the Constitution, is to have the word expressly put into what is now uh, the Tenth Amendment. They lost that. And that means that the powers that are enumerated in the Constitution are not to be, it's not to be strictly construed. Richard Nixon used to talk about being a strict constructionist. Well, that just proves, you know, he was not a constitutionalist because we sh the framers rejected the idea of strict con construction of the enumerated powers. But John also makes a second argument having to do with the necessary and proper clause. Um, the Necessary and Proper Clause does not give Congress new areas of authority. It, gives, it, it's, it doesn't give implied powers. It gives incidental powers. And do not mistake the difference between those. Uh, an implied power is a new area of authority. An incidental power is a tool, a means by which uh, Congress may effectuate the powers it already has. Quick example, you know, Congress is not given the general power to pass criminal laws, 
but it has given the power to um, to have a post office, and so if if people are if if, if you know you you have people um, trying to steal from the mails, they have a it's okay for Congress to pass a criminal law protecting the post office by having a criminal law against stealing uh, the mails. That's what the necessary and proper clause uh, does. Now. Um, John points to the second part of this, which reads, uh, Congress shall have the power to you know, make necessary and proper laws for carrying into the execution all other powers vested in this Constitution in the government of the United States. He, I heard him over and over say that that means unenumerated powers or implied powers. And in his paper, he says, well, there aren't any others, but there are. So the first part of necessary and proper says the foregoing powers. That's in Article One, Section Eight, and it's a reference to clauses one through sixteen of Article One, Section Eight. There are other powers given to both Congress and the United States and various officers elsewhere. Take, for example, Article Four, which is where the territory's power is. The, the power to pass laws having to do with. Uh, with uh, uh, giving uh, full faith and credit to uh, uh, to the acts of other states, the, uh, uh, the power expressly said to pertain to the United States and not just to Congress is the Republican form of government clause. Plus, are all of the powers that are given to the uh, executive branch and to the judiciary, which I think are references in the third part of the necessary and proper clause. I see no reason to think. That the, that the second part of the national of the necessary and proper clause has anything to do with implied powers. It is giving the incidental powers to carry into execution the powers that are not in Article One, Section Eight, clauses one one through sixteen. I, that's just, to my mind, not a mystery. That seems perfectly clear from the language of the Constitution. Thank you. Um, all right, I've got more questions, but I um, want to be mindful of uh, any interest in the audience to ask questions. Let me remind you, a, a question is a, a short statement followed by a question mark at the end. Um, anybody have any questions? Hi, Hi. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, this is specifically for uh, Professor McConnell, or that's who I had in mind. Uh, but either either of you could uh, touch on this since you both addressed it a little bit. But Professor McConnell, uh, you brought up the confederalist or confederationist position and how uh, perhaps the uh, panel would be um, you know, even more fulfilling if there was a representative of that position on the panel, so I'm, I'm curious who those uh, scholars are and uh, what you know, particular works of theirs uh, we should read to find out about that position. Uh, they couldn't get a job in a modern law school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but not because there's nothing to be said for their position, it's just that you know, we're not exactly the most tolerant and inclusive industry uh, in America. I don't know, John, is there somebody whose work you would recommend? No. Uh, I have to think about that. <laughs> um, In the meantime, read Professor well, McConnell's there's book. Some, maybe Raul, Raul Berger's book on federalism that I, I did a review of back in about 1986. Yes, that would be uh, that would be a good place to start. Federalism: the, the Founder's Design was right. the title of the book. That's probably right. a place to start, and then read my review, which is not <laughs> complimentary. <laughs> All right, uh, Garrett Snedeker, uh, Scalia Law School, but I'm also wearing a hat with the James Wilson Institute where I'm the deputy director. It's seldom at conferences like this where we're talking about our namesake, uh, James Wilson, with such fervor and intensity, um, and we're obviously grateful. But I wanna make sure that I understand you, uh, Professor uh, McConnell. I uh, count you as a friend, I count Professor McHale as a friend, but there seems to be uh, some, some heated disagreement, so I was hoping we could clear the air a little on Wilson. Um, if I understand you right, uh, Professor McConnell, you hold that Wilson's uh, statements are not um, positive proof that the ratification of the Constitution 
uh, you know, there was unanimity within this idea that they were creating one, one nation. I mean, uh, is, is that right? Because I have Wilson's statements at the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention, which he states the following, uh, by adopting this system, we become a nation. At present, we are not one. And he goes on to say, this system, sir, will at least make us a nation and put it in the power of the union to act as such. We will be considered as such by every nation in the world. We will regain the confidence of our own citizens and command the respect of others. At, at, from listening, I, I, I understand you, you attribute it much more to the lived experience um, from 1787 through uh, the Civil War. That's what made this considered instead of uh, these United States to be the United States. But it seems like Wilson, in the ratification debates, he, he thought it was settled. Um, and so I, I was hoping maybe, maybe I just misunderstood you. So Wilson, like most of them, are a little complicated. And when it comes to ratification, there are times when he gets with the program but, uh, and sounds a lot like Madison and the, the Federalist Papers. I, uh, I could, here's a, a, a quote from his, uh, his uh, speech on October 6, 1787. It, I won't read the quote, but it, it basically it says pretty much what, what, the, what the Federalist Papers say. At other times, he makes statements like the one that you referred to this issue of a nation sounds to our ears kind of like a platitude, but this was actually a pretty controversial proposition What? because nation to them meant something like a consolidated union. And so this is where he is speaking the quiet part out loud, I, I think. Uh, interest, the, but what did the convention do? Uh, right after the adoption of the Connecticut Compromise, the very first thing that they do is that they strike out the word nation from the draft. And every place that the word nation appears in the draft of the Constitution, it is struck out. And they substitute various locutions, like the general government or the government of the United States. But they cut out the word nation everywhere. And even in the debate over the First Amendment, when Madison proposes uh, that the First Amendment be uh, be worded no national, there should be no national establishment of religion. Uh, Elbridge Gerry throws a hissy fit about that. Oh, see, this proves that you were really creating a nation after all. And Madison throws up his arms and say, okay, whatever. And they don't use the word nation in uh, national. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure where that leaves us, except that. Wilson apparently didn't command a majority about whether it was a nation or not. Uh, maybe one last question. Hi there, William Morris, 3L Stanford Law School. Thanks to our panelists for representing our fine institution. Uh, my question here is we talked about how the Constitution really gets its power from the people, and then the 17th Amendment cut out the states as the middlemen with respect to the Senate. So now, do we the people need, or rather do we still need, the states as our intercessors against the federal government? Thank you. Professor McCall. Thank you for that question. It's a good opportunity for me maybe to clarify that um, even on the ultra-nationalist positions that I'm attributing to people like Wilson and Morris, there is a large swath, uh, swath of authority that remains with the states. They, they, it was a caricature of their position to say that they thought you know, the states should disappear or the federal government would do everything. I think that's not true at all. They understood perfectly well that the states were necessary uh, uh, components of uh, this uh, government, this uh, system that they were erecting. Um, the key concept is concurrent authority. So um, listening to what Judge Sutton said earlier today, you know, that really resonates. The power to regulate is the power to preempt, and that is the awesome power given to the federal government. But whenever the federal government decides to stay its hand, the states step in and do a lot of regulation, and they should. Um, those are policy questions. Um, the Constitution does vest the preeminent supreme authority in the federal government to preempt when it so chooses. But it doesn't follow that any of the founders, even the most nationalist, 
um, you know, wanted a federal government to regulate on every matter. They didn't understand that local is better often as a policy matter. So I just think we should avoid, you know, slipping into these kinds of extremes or an either or situation. These were sophisticated people who understood that to govern a, a, you know, a continent, they foresaw that the United States was going to be a continental empire, I believe, certainly out to the Mississippi um, at that time already, that the states were gonna play an essential role. So it's a great question, and um, that's a clarification that I would offer. I think it's really a question more about sort of where we are rather than what the Constitution says. And my opinion is the states are more vital today than at least in my lifetime uh, that and what we see is you know under Mr. Trump uh, the it was the blue states it was places like you know Cuomo in New York and and California that were organizing an alternative vision of government with respect even to some seriously federal powers like uh, like control over the, the border and immigration and and the same thing has been happening in reverse under a little bit under Obama and maybe even more so now under President uh, uh, Biden and this I think is a good thing because it's this tension between points of view uh, and the way in which the states have, are again emerging as, as the uh, organizing uh, uh, points for opposition, and, not, and when I talk about opposition, I don't mean res a kind of negative resistance. You know, just I'm talking about alternative visions of the common good, and uh, I, that, to my mind, I'm I'm more committed to the idea that states are important than ever. Thank you. I'm going to ask you all to thank me and uh, th join me in thanking the panel in just a moment. But before we do. <laughs> I have a public service announcement. Our next panel on the executive power will begin in 15 minutes. In the meantime, please join us for the short film, Madison and the Fight for the Constitution, premiering now and here in this room. But before we see that, please join me in thanking the <laughs>